second version of the Super Soldier Serum. Yeah, we're, we're back, we're back, we're back, we're back! ...while trying to harness the power of the Tesseract's but his surprise return as the guardian of the Soul Stone in Infinity War only served to remind us how great he was so many years ago. Cassilius. He might have been just a disciple of Dormammu, but Cassilius was unintimidating in his own right. A highly trained sorcerer who went rogue, left the Ancient One's order to try to take out the masters of the mystic arts, nearly succeeded. In Doctor Strange, Cassilius manages to destroy two sanctions. Okay, let's see if I can get a win in before Midget gets home. Even if he was technically the B-list baddie in Doctor Strange, he'll always be an A-lister to us. Crossbones. Brock Rumlow started out as a member of Captain America's strike team in Winter Soldier, eventually revealing himself as a Hydra agent when he attempted takeover with him. He managed to survive, and resurfaced during the opening fight in Civil War, where he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with both Cap and Black Widow before blowing himself up in the event that ended up driving the Avengers apart. For a villain, a critical vote for God. Dormammu. He's one of the biggest villains in Marvel Comics, and the MCU actually kept the extremely powerful ruler of the Dark Dimension relatively close to the end of time. Doctor Strange's trip to the Dark Dimension was practically a Steve Ditko fan of Black and White. Dormammu I miss Ditko. His work. Steve Ditko was a great artist. The Mamu have come to bargain! I mean, yeah. Fucking... That scene only works because of Benedict. Ultron. James Spader brought absolute terror to another moment that was 
with a near endless supply of robot batteries and a resource. Spader can provide, verbally sparring with the best of them. Like any great villain, Ultron also has a real motivation for his dashing routine. Looking at the facts, Ultron's final determination that humans and superheroes are what make the world such a dangerous place makes its own twisted kind of sense. Helmut Zemo. The most amazing thing about Helmut Zemo is that the world is his own man of God. No plans for world domination. Just a man who wants revenge for the death of his family, wise enough to realize the best way to take up the adventure is to set them against him. The world does require a few big leaps of his life. It is not to see a villain like you know brought to life and win to you. He's a great reminder that it doesn't take great smashing superpowers to get through the Oi! 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 Ego. Peter Quill is a journey that brought him face to face with Kurt Russell's ego. Who is as bad a dad as they come? Yes, Drax. I got it. Ah, thank you. Ego is one of the most powerful villains in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Right up there alongside Thanos himself. Ego is essentially a god who wants to literally become the universe by supplanting all other life. And Russell sells it so well that you really understand where Ego is coming from. Even if he's a psychopath who's got hundreds of his own children. Just a second! Ego redefined the concept of daddy issues. The vulture. In a universe of world destroying monsters, the vulture is decidedly street level in his approach. But that's exactly what makes him work. The writers tweak his backstory to make Adrian Tim the father of Peter Parker's senior son. Yes, yes, you're back! And he takes two girlfriends and the dad to a poor home in the The effects team also did an amazing job with his arm of the look, with the vulture looking comfortable in the first time and inhuman when he's stalking his prey. Hello. We've never seen Thor face a villain like Hella, the goddess of death, in any of the rest of the film. Much like Loki before him, this Asgardian villain is someone audiences will immediately love to hear. As soon as the villain passes away, Hela appears to the brothers and presents her plan to take her rightful place on Asgard's throne. To prove her point, she easily crushes Thor's hammer. The truth is eventually revealed that Hela once acted as Odin's execution, leading the Asgardian army to victory over all nine realms. This secret history elevates Hela to epic villain status. Eric Killmonger. Eric Killmonger essentially has a superhero's origin. His father is killed right in front of him. His royal heritage is denied to him, and he uses those tragedies to motivate a relentless dedication, training himself to the peak of his abilities before he can finish. That setup is a whole lot closer to Batman than it is to, say, Crossbones or Ultron. When you add in the fact that Killmonger specifically wants to address a continuing history of racism, it's hard not to admit that he makes some pretty good points. Even if he's right, though, his goal is dominant rather than leadership, which makes him a true ideological component for T'Challa. It's one of the things that makes their final battle, in which they're in both nearly identical black magic costumes, so good. Their reflection is each other, both committed to fight for their ideals without compromising who they are. Loki. While we originally said that villains turned good guys weren't going to be up to this, we have to make an exception for the god of mystery. Especially since Loki was a baddie for multiple Marvel movies who caused so much chaos throughout the movie. Tom Hiddleston is so good at being bad that Marvel opted to keep him around long after his book for supremacy was spoiled at the hands of Earth's mightiest heroes. He's still no match for the Hulk. Here we go. But who is? Oh wait, they don't wait. Thanos. Thanos is the villain of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's been a lot of character work put into this cinematic version of Thanos, which is especially impressive considering that most of it is shown to the audience in Infinity War, a movie that's also juggling story arcs for dozens of other characters at the same time. Through it all, he's shown to have the same quality that all the greatest villains should. He thinks he's right. He's the hero of his own story. 
the only one who can step up and save the universe from itself, and is willing to sacrifice whatever he needs to in pursuit of that goal. In the comics, Thanos has been referred to as the ultimate nihilist, but the MCU version is the exact opposite. He believes very much in what he's doing, which makes him even more compelling and more dangerous. Crusaders and awesome Avengers are everywhere you look at the movies, and there's a great collection of five things and blockbusters that take the format to new heights. From 70s classics to modern day epics, these are the 30 best superhero movies ever made. This 2010 film, based on the comic series of the same name, isn't your typical superhero story, and that's exactly what makes it so great. It's the story of a kid who really has no business being a hero, but does it anyway, with bone-cracking, profane, and over-the-top action. Kick-Ass proved to be a breakout project for Aaron Johnson and Chloe Grace Moretz, and when veteran weirdo Nicolas Cage is involved, how can you possibly go wrong? <laughs> Never mind. Kick-Ass is great, though. Chronicle gives the superhero genre the found footage treatment, telling the story of three teenagers who stumble upon a mysterious extraterrestrial object that grants them seemingly limitless superpowers. Of course, being a teen is hard enough, but being a teen with telekinesis? Well, that's too much of a burden to bear, and this superhero origin story quickly turns evil. A surprise hit, the movie resonated with critics and fans alike. Sure, there are moments where you'll wonder why the cameras are still rolling as psychic high school students battle it out in the sky, but the movie is such a tense thrill ride that you'll quickly forget any flaws as the movie heads towards its inevitable and horrific showdown. Big Hero 6 is a loose adaptation of a quirky, obscure Marvel comic and was one of the best films of 2014, animated superhero or otherwise. It follows a kid whose brother is tragically killed in a fire, and how he moves on from that loss by making friends with his brother's robots and the friends he left behind. When they realize there must have been more to the fire than it seemed, they suit up as superheroes to get justice, but not even the film's villain is as cut and dried as it might appear. The visuals are great, the tone is pitch perfect, and there's even a Stan Lee cameo. Liam Neeson has a special set of skills, and that usually involves playing dudes you just don't mess with. I see you when you're sleeping. I know who you're like. But before he fought human traffickers, wolves, and Lego lawbreakers, he was Dark Man. This flick finds Neeson playing Peyton Wesley, a scientist who becomes a scarred and reluctant superhero. Beneath the layers of monster makeup, Neeson strikes a perfect balance of madness, righteous anger, and pathos. Notable for its bizarre rage sequences, clever practical effects, and campy tone, this 1990 flick feels like a mashup of Batman, Evil Dead 2, and The Phantom of the Opera. If you're tired of the usual Marvel and DC fare, this film goes to weird and wacky places most superhero movies would never dare. Hellboy is a 2004 film which follows the titular half-demon, memorably played by Ron Perlman, as he helps humanity take on supernatural threats. Director Guillermo del Toro's visual style is perfectly suited to the story, which follows Hellboy as he tries to figure out just exactly what he is, while also battling all sorts of baddies along the way. The effects work is out of this world, and the design of villains like the undead plot work Cronin is totally terrifying. It takes a special kind of magic to get Hellboy right, but del Toro and Pullman possess exactly what it takes to give us a devilishly good movie. It's an absolute miracle this blood-soaked, F-bomb-drenched movie ever made it to the big screen, but aren't we all glad it did? Deadpool lived in development hell for years, and it took the leap of a concept reel to finally jumpstart it. The results are quick, filthy, and fun, with Ryan Reynolds born to play the part. The Merc with a Mouth now holds the record for the highest grossing X-Men film and the highest grossing R-rated film in history. A magnificent conflict between Sir Patrick Stewart's Professor X and Sir Ian McKellen's Magneto 2003's X2 X-Men United is considered by many to be the best of the original X-Men trilogy, and it just couldn't be made today. That energy and fierceness has dispersed from popular imagination, replaced by the cynicism of Deadpool and the grim pessimism of Logan. Doing justice to its source material, the 1982 masterpiece God Loves, Man Kills, this film is required viewing.
With 1989's Batman, director Tim Burton managed to take a character best known for Adam West's goofiness and turn him into a serious hero for comic book fans. With the franchise's staying power fading fast in the late 1970s, it took more than a decade to finally get a new adaptation mounted. Many fans flew into an uproar over Michael Keaton's casting in the title role, but one look at the final film made all those worries melt away. Burton treated the canon seriously, and though he didn't follow it note for note, he paid tribute to it and built a living, breathing version of Gotham City. Combining the worlds of the original X-Men trilogy with the X-Men prequel sequel series was a tall order, but Brian Singer pulled it off with his return to the franchise after taking a break for a couple of films. Days of Future Past managed to weave together a story spanning decades with two separate casts and still keep all the story tight enough so even someone who's never seen an X-Men film could follow along. It also stealthily retconned out the atrocious X-Men The Last Stand, making all things right within the cinematic X-Universe. Batman Returns is less about Batman than it is about the creation of Catwoman, laid outstandingly by Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah. It also happens to feature Michael Keaton returning to his role as Batman and Danny DeVito as a hideous version of the Penguin, in a part written specifically for him. With Pfeiffer in the cat suit, Tim Burton at the height of his directorial powers, and Keaton's willingness to let his smug yet charming Bruce Wayne share the spotlight with two formidable foes, this sequel earned praise from critics and became a box office hit. <laughs> In 2019, the DC Extended Universe saw Ben Affleck hang up the Batcave, and Henry Cavill's Superman was still up in the air. Even the runaway success of Aquaman couldn't seem to save Warner Brothers' superhero franchise. That's when Shazam arrived to electrify audiences. Shazam tells the tale of Billy Batson, a kid who's granted Superman-like powers and the ability to transform into an adult by an aging wizard. The result is a movie that strips away all the DC darkness and gives us a film that's both sweet and fun. It's also a movie about the importance of family and finding your place in the world, which is a lot nicer than watching the Cape Crusader murdering people. On top of all that, Shazam has the right amount of weirdness to make it stand out from the superhero pack. It isn't afraid to embrace its oddball comic book origins, and the result is an absolute blast. And ultimately, that's kind of the point of the film. It's really fun to be a superhero. Guardians of the Galaxy earns its spot by being a galactic joy to behold.